I think I'll over to you, Jing, and uh, hopefully we can delve in deeper into some of this. Indeed, indeed. Uh, it's a great that you present the, uh, the sites and all these photos are really so rich. As the book, you know, I really enjoyed reading this book. Anyone who hasn't read it, and I highly recommend. It is such an interesting book and also so, so rich. It's because it involves many interconnected and very complex issues and some deeply rooted causes. It is by no means an easy, easy book to write, even to scope, scope it. So Wani, you have all my respect and admiration for completing this book. So my question is, uh, you touched on this, you may want to briefly uh, talk about specifically as well. What, what was the trigger for you to write this book? Also, because it's a quite emotionally charged book. Did you find writing this book emotionally draining? Yeah, that's a great question, Jing. Um, in terms of what prompted me to write a book, and I think, uh, yes, as I probably, I probably spent a couple of minutes already talking about what led me to this project because I moved on from, moved on from, I moved from the domestic inequality in the domestic and then to, to, uh, to the cultural thing. But finally, I think there is, there is space to further to explore the inequality and, and, and its intimate consequences. Because at the end of the day, unless we actually <laughs> understand how inequality impacts on individuals, and we're really halfway through, only halfway through there. Because after a while, we're concerned about inequality, if not actually to understand how it impacts on individual people's lives. So with that, I went to the field. Um, but uh, as to, to the question of whether I found it emotionally draining, to tell you the truth, um, when I was there, what I found most challenging was not so much the emotional side, it's the physical side. Um, I wasn't, I'll show you some pictures there, but I wasn't able to show you how just how humid and how hot uh, that these places are. Um, and, you know, I usually would just come from Australia and all of a sudden it's like kind of really steamy kind of Shenzhen and the body took quite a while to, to adjust to that. There's a lot of sweating and, and interviewing people, uh, the setting of for the interviews is not always kind of hospitable because I was not uh, the one that could actually say, let's meet here, let's meet this time. I usually have to go where the workers were and where it's convenient for them and at a time that suited them. Because keep in mind that they're working very, very long hours and they were generous enough to uh, spend time with me. And uh, so usually what the time I, I, I spent time with them was at the end of the day when they already have a long shift or the beginning of the day before they have the shift. So that is before seven o'clock in the morning or after eight o'clock in the evening. And so, and I, I, I just say to them, I'm, I'm just nearby, let me know when it suits you and I will be there. And usually sometimes it's a very uh, uh, sort of a, a rental room with a lot of, lot of traffic noises outside, or sometimes it's a crowded eating place. Um, so, um, and we talk and, and, you know, apart from finding facts and talking to each other, um, there was also sometimes quite emotional. And, you know, we, there is a lot of laughter, but there's also a lot of um, emotional stuff. And there's pain, you know, mm -hmm. and um, not always warm and fuzzy. It's not love stories are not always. Sometimes it's about the lack of it, lack of love. And, um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, couple of people cried and I actually was moved to tears and so that actually made me wonder what whether tears have a, a role to have a place in, in sociological research because when we come back to the field we deal with the, the cold data we do you know but actually this the embodied kind of responses were also quite important to me mm -hmm. and so but when I it's usually my dominant feeling when I was there in terms of emotion is really the gratitude and appreciation for the workers who gave me their time mm -hmm. and share with me their stories mm -hmm. they didn't have to right mm -hmm. but when I it's only after I came back from the field and start processing the data and listen to the transcripts listen to listen listen to the video or the recording and you know read the transcript and I realized a month of emotions and uh, that, that you know that that went through um, uh, that process mm -hmm. yeah I 
that's why I ask that question. And I will touch on your uh, close relationship with the, the people that you work with or, you know, the people you interviewed uh, shortly. And it is, uh, you know, involves a lot of pains because they touch on inequality. So as you have demonstrated in the book, the structural inequality that a rural migrant workers face is this rural-urban divide uh, and disparity specifically manifested, as we know, in the historical residency permit system, Hukou So anyone who has lived in China know about it. So it's extremely difficult to change rural residency status to uh, urban residency. And I often think perhaps even harder than getting a PR, permanent residency <laughs> in Australia. So would you say that having taken away their freedom of a choice, to become residency, a residence in cities because you were just born into the system. Those rural migrant workers, their marital freedom or choice have also been taken away from them or at least drastically reduced. Their emotional uh, intimate lives are no longer private matters because they have little control of them in many ways. Can you please comment on that? Yeah, again, uh, Jing, that's really a, a good question because I take I take your question as a question about the relationship between um, big structural issues and the small uh, sort of uh, everyday experience of individuals and whether there's any correlations between them and how are they correlated if, if the answer is yes. Um, big structural issues, as I'm, I'm trying to argue in this book, to show in this book, have really indeed have direct impact on, on the private lives in a way that we seldom think very carefully about. Um, for instance, let's just think about the picture that we were seeing about these workers uh, sitting in the, uh, in, in the public in a park outside the factory wearing uniforms, enjoying a moment of intimacy, right? Um, where are they enjoying their public, uh, their intimacy? They're enjoying in the public, right? Um, look, um, if you are a, 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 a two lovers, lovebirds, are sitting on, on, the, on the banks of the La Seine in Paris, or people say, oh, how nice and romantic. But if you actually are two workers um, sitting there by the road like this, and then there's a picture taken about it, and some people, as I discussed in the book, some people, middle class people's re response is that, oh, you know, how lovely, you know, they're, they're you know, they're working so hard for the, to contribute to the economy of this country. They really deserve our respect. They're really sympathetic to them. And there are other people who just say, these people, you know, they have no shame. Why are they actually showing, you know, doing intimate things in, in the public? And some people just say, can't they just go and get a room? <laughs> and, uh, and some people say, you know, they're not really into love. They don't understand what love is. It's just all pure lust, you know, all sorts of judgmental stuff. So can't they get a room? No, they actually can't get a room. And there's a whole range of things which determines that, that it's very, very hard for them to get a room. Now, so which is why, for instance, if you have hukou, urban hukou, then you're entitled to a whole range of benefits that uh, rural um, residents cannot take for granted. For instance, in housing, in employment, in education, in healthcare, um, so um, because they, they, they have a very sort of unfair disadvantage to start with. Back in the village, the education system in the rural villages is inferior to the urban ones. As, as a result of that, they're likely to go to the universities, right? So they already lost even before they, they, they get there. And, and then, so that's the education they're disadvantaged. And that's determined by Hukou to some extent. And then they go, because you can't go to the university, there are very, very little sort of options in the village. So you go to the city and you take up low-skilled sort of jobs, such as working, um, you know, in, in a factory. And so, um, and as a result of the fact it's, it's kind of a low-skilled jobs, you tend to work very long hours and with little, pay, much less pay. Right, so so in fact, it, it kind of work impact on their working conditions, and and 
because the, of the fact that of their rural status, they're not, not able to uh, enjoy subsidized housing in the same way that urban people. And they cannot, because of the low pay, they cannot afford to purchase an uh, 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 urban apartment. Because by the way, if you can afford to buy an urban apartment, that would give you extra brownie points in, ter in terms of your um, journey to become an urban person, right? So it's just kind of a vicious circle, if you like. And then they did end up living in a rental space, which is kind of crowded, shared with other people. So you can't really be intimate with someone in, in there. So dorm is, is the same situation. And on the top of that, they really can't get a room because the consumption level of power is very low. Right, and uh, middle class people say, "Oh, let's go and get a room." A room can cost a half of the month, uh, your month's salary. You know, we, you can't do that. Um, and and also, you know, um, uh, uh, you work so such a long times. You know, um, by the end of the day, you just want to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, is the hukou status determine the level of benefits and social the securities they have access to. And because they have much less benefits and security, long-term security that has and manifests itself in many different ways and all of them impact on whether they are able to access the kind of intimacy that middle-class people mm. take for granted. Mm. Um, when I read your book, I found it really enlightening to see the connection that you have built between love troubles of that are rural migrant workers, particularly male single rural migrant workers, have been enduring, and the concerns, government or public concerns for social stability and security. So the two things are connected. That's really enlightening to me. So I have two questions. One is, what kind of a role has the gender imbalance in China, which we know they, they, that exists? So what sort of a role that gender imbalance has played in causing the love troubles of rural migrant workers? And also how serious, how seriously the various levels of the Chinese government's taking this risk of social unrest? Um, yes, um, gender imbalance is um, playing a, a, a very uh, big role in, in causing uh, this uh, phenomenon. Um, there is um, a sociologist who will give you statistics, and I quoted the statistic in my book, um, that there was, you know, there's been more, more men than women. And, and the reason for that is quite historical, you know, the pre preferences for sons over uh, uh, daughters and the, you know the preferences uh, the sort of a gender selection you know um, practices um, so as a result of that you already have more men than women than women and that is itself though um, is a problem but in, it's also complicated by another problem that is the tra traditional um, practice of expectation for women to marry up rather than marry level or marry down. In other words, even if you have rural migrant women who are from more or less the similar sort of background, they don't necessarily want to see marrying a, 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 their male counterpart as a, 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 a desirable or viable option. So for instance, one of the uh, women, young women I followed, she, she told me that you know she, she would rather go out with someone who's got a, a university degrees and who um you know and she said oh he's not good looking <laughs> and you know uh he's not very tall he's a bit short but he's got a university degree i'm prepared to trade out to do the sort of thing so you know so there's kind of bottom of the then then the, the, some of the room migrant men just find them some at the very very bottom um so i think but i think at the end of the day the the biggest problem the biggest cause is is the fact that the there is high level of physical mobility, but there's very low level of social mobility, right? In other words, I, one of the men I followed, he moved from one job to another. He moved from a factory worker to a factory, that pre, uh, from a Foxconn to a factory to produce furniture, and then to, be, to, 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 to another job, which is a secret security guard in the hotel. And every time he moved is, is because he's either because he's bored of his job or he wanted to make a, a slightly higher uh, sort of, uh, sort of amount of money. Um, but each time, um, 
is low skilled sort of job and he does not accumulate social skills and uh, and economic capital and it's kind of moving across the horizontal that if you, if you like and in the meantime he gets older and older and so he's kind of more and more sort of left on the shelf to sort of speak so um yes as to your question as whether the government is worried about this, the government is uh, has been worried about it for a long time. Uh, in fact, um, as I said in chapter one of my book, starting from 2010, you see a sharp increase in academic research in China on the issue of the marital problems and issues among rural migrant workers. In Chinese, they, they call it right? And before that, it was very, very, very few. And then after that, it was a sharp increase. The reason why uh, there was such a, such a sharp increase in the quantity of research done on this area is because in, 90, in, 20, in 2010, the government issued a document, like a number one document, basically saying that we need to pay attention to the problems and the issues facing by uh, the rural migrant workers in their private love life. Um, um, so I could see that, you know, there is um, a sense of anxiety, if you like, on the part of the state, because uh, um, the knowledge, the, fact, uh, the existence of a large cohort of unmarried um, young people, particularly male, sort of uh, 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 marginalized uh, people, um, sometimes is seen to be a cause for concern in terms of social stability. And social stability cannot be very conducive to political stability. So there is kind of a unwritten assumption, but the link uh, there. And so, you know, I, I attract the kind of literature that's been produced in, for a whole decade. Mm -hmm. And 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 I also noticed in 2020, just a couple of years ago, um, China's uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, came up with new survey about um, you know how many rural migrant workers we have and how many of them from the uh, Baling Ho, the people who were born in the 80s and the people born in the 90s, and how uh, uh, a significant percentage of the people who are born in Baling Ho are still single. They're in their 30s and 40s now in terms of age. And a lot of them um, are still yearning for a life, for a partner. So um, the uh, National Statistics Bureau has uh, has its own social sciences division, which in turn commissioned its researchers to go out and conduct a large surveys within different provinces in China, particularly the sending zones of rural migrant workers, just to just to see what just how how widespread the problem is and what the situation is, and encouraging academics and the scholars to come up with recommendations. Um, yes, so in a nutshell, there is a lot of concern. Mm. It's um really interesting. And um, I also want to come back to this inequality. You know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, I love your translation, matching doors and windows. So, uh, you know, Chinese tradition, they do focus on matching uh, education, uh, all sorts of backgrounds, family backgrounds and all sorts. Um, I also noticed there is one thing that I very interesting to me is a concept around uh, left over men, because uh, outside China, especially, there has been a lot of reporting on issues around left over women, mm. in China, which I came across a lot when I subtitled the Chinese dating show, If You're the One, Fei Chong Wura. But there mm. isn't much mention of uh, left over men. Left over women are primarily concerned with urban educated white collar women mm -hmm. a leftover man in your book especially specifically refer to single male rural migrant workers mm. so the attention the amount of attention received between leftover men and leftover women is very different would you see this disparity also be conceived can be conceived as a type of inequality between rural migrant workers and urban workers Oh yeah, yeah, um, yes. Um, you know, you're right. Uh, the issue of leftover women, Shengnu, has got a lot of press coverage in the West as well as in China. 
Um, and it, it, in contrast, the amount of tension uh, that the, the, the leftover men, this, this figure of the leftover men had received um, is much, much less. Um, so I think, you know, in, in a way, uh, it's, it, it itself is, it shows that inequality is not just about, uh, you know, the disparity in terms of who has access to housing or, or better income. It is also about um, who has a more discursive power, if you like, uh, who has um, more control over the kind of stories they want to tell about themselves. Um, the differences, the core differences between the left of a man and left of a woman is, um, is that, um, well, class is sort of a difference, right? The left of a women tend to come from educated, urban, professional women who have chosen not to get married for a whole range of reasons. Whereas the left of a man come from a lower socioeconomic struct uh, structure, if you like, and their workers. And they really, really want to uh, uh, have an opportunity to be able to afford a bride, to, 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 to be able to go on date. And uh, so in, in other words, um, some people, when I was telling some people in the West about this kind of uh, contrast between the two groups and one of the persons and I told this uh, thing and said, he came back, back with a joke. Oh, why can't they just marry each other? Problem solved, right? You've got a group of women, you know, single, you've got a group of men, single. And, and I said, well, that is indeed the, the poignant question is that they were, the two should never meet. And in, in that, uh, the, you know, um, the difference between these group, two group is that for the left of women, it is by choice. Whereas by, for the left of a man, it is because they have no choice, right? And so, in other words, inequality is not just about material ones. It's about who gets heard, who gets the visibility, and how much control people have over the narratives. We don't hear much about the rural migrant men because they, they have not only less money and a disposable income, they have much less discursive power as well. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, the, the next thing I also find very interesting that you actually talk about in the book, which is new-ish uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, as I wasn't so much aware of the uh, concept or existence of the second generation of a rural migrant workers, what is called non mm. and uh, who's, you know, um, they are children of the first generation, and their marital circumstances in particular are vastly different from those of their parents, the first generation. Their existential predicament, as you have put it, is they can't go back to the village, but can't settle down in the city either without a city residency permit. So their lifestyle in a broad way is much more aligned with that of their urban counterparts with, a, of, of course, a key issue of residency. Does it mean that these land stand a slightly better chance in dating marrying partners with a city residency? Uh, what's your view on the third generation of rural migrant workers? Are you optimistic of the mm. future? Mm. I, I guess, Jing, to answer the question, we probably need to backtrack a little bit and to give people some idea of oh, who is the first generation, who is the second generation. Um, China's rural to urban migration started in the late, in the eighties, I would say, and it really uh, sort of started to accelerate in the in the nineties. For so for those people who left the village and go to work in the city in the eighties, nineties, uh, they they are we call them first generation rural migrant workers. By the time they went, most of them were already married, right? So they went to the city with a very very clear agenda. I want to go to get whatever job that I can to make as much money as I can so I can come back to the village and have, so, uh, have some money that I can use to either to see my son um, getting married or build a house for my son so that he can get married or you know, provide some kind of security for them. So this, or the, the, the goal is always to make money and go back and the fa whole family you know, have this kind of the same kind of agenda. And, and those people in the first generation, I would 
now would be in their 60s, 50s and 60s now. Um, some of them are still in the city, but a lot of them have returned in the village. Uh, the second generation, or the, the Chinese term terminology is a new generation, Xing Sheng Dai. Uh, they are actually, this is actually quite a broad umbrella term, which includes both those people who are born in the 1980s and those people who are born in the 1990s. So if you do the sums, you see that they're, they're in their 30s, you know, and uh, some beginning to be in the 40s. And these are the people, uh, they're called the second generations. And within the second generations, you've got, the, you know, we call the Baling Ho and the Jiu Ho. And the, I, this is the co two hosts of people I studied in my group. And they are, are not, you just mentioned the third generation, which is the, currently the people who are born after the new millennium, right? They're in 18, 19 years old, but they're already working there. Um, but to come back to your question as to whether they have a better chance of integrating themselves in, into the city or even having a better chance of dating some uh, somebody uh, who has urban hukou, um, I think that comparison um, may not be as meaningful as the comparison between the two cohorts in terms of what their life, uh, their goal, their expectations. You know, the difference between the new generations and the, the parents' generation is that these newer generations, migrants, they really have very little knowledge and interest in farming. They have been in the city a lot of, for a long time. And some of them were even brought up or born in the city. And um, they could actually go back to the village anytime they want, but they don't really want to. Right. So, but they really want to stay in the city. But because of the Hukou status and because of the a whole range of reasons, they don't really see a long term prospect of actually being able to stay on. So that is why this this thing about not being able to go back and not being able to stay on. So, in other words, compared with his parents' generations, their expectations are a lot higher. And because the expectations are a lot higher, and they also look on the surface a lot more urban. In terms of their fashion, look at the clothes, and look at the demeanor, you know, the, the complexion. That uh, you know, uh, just look like you, you walk down the street, you don't really can't you can't really tell who is a, a, a urban person who is not. Um, but and also they are very exposed to internet culture, the popular music, and the love stories, and the romances, and the Western style advertising about intimacy and all that kind of the whole ideas in this kind of the embrace that. So as a result of that, they are more caught up in the contradiction between um, expectations and the reality. And they are all sort of stuck, if you like, between the traditional practices in, the, in the expectations of their parents and, and, and their yearnings and expectations of what life might uh, become. And so that's aspiration, if you like. So I think it's actually more complex uh, in a way, more agonizing, more difficult, because they are more, you know, they live out this kind of dilemma on day-to-day -day basis, whereas parents' gender is a lot more simple. Yeah, well said. Um, we must touch on this love on the assembly line before I can let you go. So it's just really interesting because you mentioned it, uh, love on the assembly line, you know, by Jia Dai Tang Fei, and you can see these pictures. When I look at these uh, photos, uh, you know, this uh, actually Jia Dai Tang Fei won an international photography award for these photos. I actually felt heart wrenching. Uh, when I see these images, it actually pained me and it made me cringe because this Shanghai based professional photographer who is very good, you know, Jia Dai Tang Fei, he offered a rural migrant workers, as you said, uh, a free wedding photo shoots uh, during his visit to a factory in Shanghai. And these factory, these factory workers couldn't afford photos when they got married. So they wouldn't in a position to say no. So obviously they said yes. So they were kind of enticed by this free offer, free photo shooting offer. And then Jia Dai Tang Fei positioned the couples and arranged the setting, knowing what he wanted from a professional photojournalist perspective a story that he wanted to tell. So do you think this creation and the publication of this photo essay series itself can be seen as a manifestation or evidence of intimate inequality? 
that rural migrant workers are trapped in? Uh, that's a great question because I think I think you alert to the fact that you know inequality is not just about uh, material matters; it's about the whole sets the terms and conditions of storytelling, um, and who controls the narrative. Um, I have to say to, at the start that the, the, this middle class urban photographer has nothing but good intentions and he's extremely compassionate towards the workers. And that is why he wants to uh, spend a lot of time and resources uh, photographing this group of people. Um, however, um, uh, my analysis of these photos. Uh, uh, it suggests that it's it's a lot more complex than that. Um, for instance, uh, when I show those photos to Westerners, middle class people, intelligentsia, um, and and I show it to a couple of journalists in the West who interviewed me, and I said, you know, look at these photos. And they said, oh, this is so powerful. This is amazing. You know, setting these workers against the the kind of industrial um, milieu is just brings out the fragility and the vulnerability of, of, of all these workers and, and eliciting more compassion for these workers. And so that's the kind of transnational middle-class uh, aesthetic sensibility, if you like. And I think uh, this group of photos speaks to that kind of sensibility. Um, but when I actually took, the, I saw these photos and I, the group of photos, my immediate reaction is that I wonder what workers will make of this. So what I did is I, I, I copied these photos and put them on an iPad. And as part of my interviews, when I sat down with individual workers, by the way, I didn't say that as for the, during the three years, I managed to, to interview uh, around 50 individuals, sitting down them one-to-one -one open-ended conversations, usually lasting about an hour and a half or something. So as part of the interviews, I'll just say, have a look at this picture and have a look at this group of pictures. Tell me what comes up Comes come to your mind? What's your emotional reaction? Most of them will look at them quite carefully, took a long time to formulate their thoughts. And most, mostly, in most, um, on most occasions, their response is that, oh, I think it, it's cold. You know, uh, some people say just like chilly. I, I, and now that you mean chilly in, in terms of temperature, and they said, no, it's also just, just metallic, you know. Um, and I said, but don't you think that's the, uh, that's, that's artistically creative? Because, you know, what's the, what's the point of, uh, you know, take, you know, taking a traditional conventional wedding photo by taking, you know, a, you know, against the backdrop of beautiful beaches and, you know, natural and park and everything. And they say, Yes, I would like to have pictures taken against a, a backdrop of a beach or a, a nice park with green space. Um, and I said also, oh, but, but wouldn't that be a cliche? They say, well, this kind of, this is not cliche to other people, but it's cliche to me because I work here every day on my wedding day or, or you know, on a wedding photo shooting shoot day. I like to get out of this so I can forget about it. I don't want to remind remind myself of what kind of drudgery that I'm I'm in there every day, right? So, um, so it just shows me that. Uh, but workers, as you, as you mentioned, did not get to choose the background. They were happy to go along with this because. It, they thought it afforded them an opportunity to to to, to create a, a kind of a moment of romance that they actually otherwise miss out on. Um, but at the same time, they didn't get to choose how to pose and uh, against what uh, to to have the photo taken. And um, so, in a way, you know, the photographer was compassionate, but at the same time, he was expecting the workers to perform. Uh, uh, his his own uh, sort of uh, aesthetic sort of uh, expectations, um, which I think is quite interesting if we look at this from the point of view of uh, workers as being generating not only the surplus values in material terms, but also generating sort of symbolic values for the middle class and cultural production. Indeed, yeah. indeed. I mean, when I just look at these photos to see exactly, uh, you know, wedding gowns that they were wearing, and uh, their suits that are men wearing, you know, identical, of course. 
So that's and, a, and the the last um, picture on the right bottom mm, is a single woman. Mm, if you read the story, if you yes, read the book, you yes. will find there's a story about her. She mm. actually uh, was she's not mm. she's not with a man. She's by herself, and the, uh, the, her husband left her because uh, she was ill, and her husband just left her. So, but the uh, the photographer wanted to take a picture of her as well to you know to to give her an opportunity to put on a, a nice gown and have a picture taken. Mm. I know we are over time, but I cannot not ask this last quick question. We touched on this because the whole book is about intimacy. You know, the questions, the interviews that you've had is of a very personal nature. So how did you win their trust as an Australian researcher? Because you as Australian, you know, so and did you find like your foreign or international identity make it easier or harder for you? It is both it is harder in the sense that uh, um i need to tell them from the beginning i'm from overseas i have the research project i want to do and i want to talk to you and then um, immediately people know there is you know in terms of you know where you belong and where i belong I have nothing to do with you know why should i open them up myself up to you so there's the issue there's a barrier coming up straight away and it's no in the sense that, that compared with my uh, Western looking anthropological counterpart, I have an advantage in a sense that I could actually become less conspicuous and um, I speak the language. And uh, so, in that sense, I do have an advantage. Um, but um, it is building trust is absolutely essential and takes a long time. It took, took a long time. And um, which is why um, what I call the longitudinal research is very important. Um, that which is why, apart from the one-off interviews, I actually return to repeatedly return to the ten people I have chosen, and uh, year after year, and follow uh, them their life, and you know to see what sort of changes have taken place. Um, and uh, and each year I see them, and they will say, "Oh, you're back again." The second year, "Oh, you're back again." And I said, yes, I'll be back next year. And they said, they probably said, oh, yeah, right. And next year I said, oh, you're back again. So the, the, you can tell that some, some of the uh, uh, stuff they told me didn't, they didn't tell me in the first year. And uh, some started to open up in the second year. Some, you know, started telling me in the third year. And some actually started telling me things after I actually left the field work and started writing. And I kept in touch with them on WeChat because I continue to follow their life and they continue to stay in touch with me. So it is a very long process. But what made my initial breakthrough absolutely um, uh, in, uh, made that happen is the is the uh, role of the local NGO workers. Their job it is it was to uh, provide adv advocacy and and help for for the for the workers. And they organize a whole range of cultural and artistic and training and opportunities for the workers. So NGO workers were really really instrumental to me in two ways. First of all, the workers already trust them. So if they say I've got a colleague from overseas who's doing research. Can you go and talk to them? Most of them were happy to oblige, right? That's first of all. That they literally just create this access for me. On the other hand, they also are the kind of in my informant in the sense that they know the workers' life very well. They've been working with these workers for a long time. So they inform me, they give me a lot of information that I'm not able to read from books. Or not not necessary, or even necessary from the workers themselves. And the third, uh, the thirdly, is that they are the one that organize the whole range of activities. And uh, I was able to uh, participate in those activities, uh, whether it's an English language class or whether it's a, a television watching uh, sort of session. So that that just provided more opportunities for me to be there uh, in a more natural setting, which is more trust sort of conducive, trust building conducive. So it's a whole range of uh, time and efforts and the help of the uh, um, other people. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly your care, your respect, you know, the, your patience has all paid off. Um, you know, so that's really great. Uh, if anyone who's interested in more about the book, or reading about the book, articles about this book, we have a few uh, links to the articles, to interviews. And then you can take a shot of this screen. 
and uh, look it up uh, as well. Uh, I have to, and also the links in the chat as well, you can cut and paste. 